Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Brett Wilson, CEO and Chairman of Prairie Merchant Corp., a private merchant bank which invests in five major areas, including energy, agriculture, real estate, entertainment, and sport. Prior to founding Prairie Merchant Corp., Mr. Brett Wilson co-founded investment banking advisory firm Wilson Mackey & Co. in 1991 and in 1993 co-founded First Energy Capital Corp. alongside Rick Grafton, Jim Davidson, and Murray Edwards. Mr. Brett Wilson was a Season 3, 4, and 5 panelist on CBC Television's Dragon's Den and has written regularly on entrepreneurship for Oil Week, Alberta Venture, and the National Post. His sports interests include ownership in the National Predators of the National Hockey League, and he has also supported hundreds of charities, including the Southern Alberta Institute of Urology, the David Foster Foundation, Right to Play, and the Wilson Center for Domestic Abuse Studies at the Calgary Counseling Center. Mr. Brett Wilson obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Saskatchewan and an MBA degree from the University of Calgary. Mr. Brett Wilson was also awarded the Order of Canada in 2011. Among other things, we sat down and discussed the early days of First Energy and a few of the lessons learned along the way. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Canada Action, whose belief is that the Canadian oil and natural gas industry is a force of good in the world, and that history will look back upon the sector favorably. Canadian energy plays a critical role in our society by reinforcing global energy security, underpinning Canadian economic prosperity, and setting the benchmark for environmental leadership. Get your free stickers at buildcanadaup.ca to show your support, or follow Canada Action on social media. This episode is brought to you by Galatea Technologies. Galatea is a software company based in Calgary that is focused on helping producers better manage their fluid logistics. Galatea enables field operators and truck drivers with the ability to make the optimal decision on every waste, water, or clean oil load resulting in 20% savings on trucking and disposal costs. The Galatea platform makes it easy to create digital truck tickets, manifests, and shipping documents that automatically flow through the field data capture and finance systems. Galatea's platform is used by over 50% of Canadian producers, 600 trucking companies, and hundreds of disposal locations. Visit GalateaTech.com to learn more about how to optimize that last line on your lease op. This episode is brought to you by the Canadian Gas Association. The Canadian Gas Association represents Canada's natural gas delivery industry, whose members include distribution companies, transmission companies, equipment manufacturers, and other service providers. The Canadian Gas Association members deliver safe, reliable, and affordable natural gas to meet 38% of Canada's energy needs. Visit cga.ca to learn more about Canada's natural gas. This podcast is brought to you by Energy United. Energy United is an organization with a mission to promote practical energy policy across Canada. Energy United is building a community of Canadians that are passionate about Canada's natural gas and oil industry and are willing to take action. Energy United is driving change on issues that matter all the way from the carbon tax to the emissions cap. Join Energy United to make a difference at energyunited.ca. Good morning, Mr. Brett Wilson. Thank you very much for doing this again. Pleasure to be on board. I really appreciate your time for part two. A lot of people know you for your financial contributions to the community, but perhaps they don't recognize your most valuable contribution, which is your time, the Mm -hmm. most valuable resource of all. So thank you. You are equally likely to be found in a banker's hall boardroom as <laughs> a small town rodeo. Have you always had that man of the people aspect to you? Or That's a, an interesting observation and one that I, uh, I actually appreciate because I haven't looked at it that way. But, you know, I grew up in small town Saskatchewan, North Battleford. The Battlefords was home. You know, I was 16, 17 when I got out of there and headed to Saskatoon to do an engineering degree. And I still remember my first day in engineering class looking around at the mostly guys that were there because it was 95% men or boys. And, uh, you know, the T-shirts were a little worn and the jeans had holes in them before that was popular. And, uh, you know, everyone looked kind of like geeks. 
I looked around and realized that I fit in for the first time. So I was, was one of them. It was a great place to be. So I, uh, I really gelled in my time on the campus doing my engineering degree, headed to Edmonton to start with and then Calgary. And in Edmonton, I had the privilege of working in the uh, drilling, Edmonton, a little bit of Calgary. I worked in the drilling department for Imperial Oil. Well, we drilled wells across Canada. So it gave me the privilege of, without realizing it, getting to know where every property was in Western Canada. I worked up in the Arctic. I worked in Northern BC. I worked all across Alberta. I worked across Southern Saskatchewan. So what was happening there was I was learning the oil and gas industry's sort of vernacular with Without realizing how much I was learning. Finished my engineering degree, went and got a business degree at the University of Calgary and graduated there and ultimately got in with one of the big investment banks and then left there after five, six years and evolved into helping, you know, effectively build our own investment bank from scratch focused on energy. So going back to your earlier question, I'm comfortable downtown, but I'm also comfortable almost anywhere. I think I've seen you at the, uh, Bull busting in Invermere as yep. an example. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. That's a great place to hang. I thought for the purposes of today's conversation, we could structure it on the early days of First Energy, maybe rewind the clock back to the entrepreneurial spirit and times of that era. If that works for you? Yeah, no, happy to uh happy to cover that. Maybe to start from the top for the listener, what was First Energy? So First Energy Capital Corp, full name, is a uh, investment bank focused on energy. It today is owned by one of the big U.S. firms called Stifle or Stifle, but they still use and celebrate the name First Energy as it relates to their, call it their energy business in uh, in Canada. So it's Stifle First Energy, not Stifle. First Energy has um, survived the the circus of pretty much 30 years. We started it in 1993, and here we are in 23, 24. Clearly, 30 years have gone by, and I was there for 13 years. That was my, uh, I was all in. It's probably the best way of <laughs> describing it. I guess the question is why I start First Energy at the time? You know, I worked for one of the big investment banks, McLeod Young Weir, which became Scotia McLeod. Great shop, great people, great learning. In fact, the senior partners that I, uh, that I worked for went on to become true legends in the industry from David Wilson to Jim McDonald to Dan Sullivan, blah, blah, blah. I ended up having the privilege of being sort of a, a junior in the presence of some of these guys, again, who went on to be absolute icons in the Canadian investment industry, not just energy. So great learning without realizing how much I was learning. Spent five years there and realized that I was I really wanted to be with a firm where the Calgary office, the Calgary operation would focus on energy. I felt that the McLeod approach, which was anyone and everyone who's active in the West, let's help them all. And I felt that we weren't coming to the table with enough knowledge about the individual business. So the idea of leaving to work in a shop that was focused on energy would allow me to bring my background and call it the foreground, whatever I'm working on on my desk, to the future of what we were doing as businesses. So again, I spent five years at McLeod. I jumped ship. I won't name the name, but I jumped ship to a shop for a year and a half. And I knew after five days that I would be leaving. It's just the chemistry wasn't right, but I didn't have a place to go. And the learning curve was steep and uh, I was getting paid based on uh, the revenue I generated. So it was a direct eat what you kill in the industry. And I had the the good fortune of bringing in several significant pieces of business very quickly in my career. So I stuck it out to try and complete those pieces of business and then get paid for them. Well, that ended up lasting longer than expected. So I was a year and a half. But as I was finishing up that year and a half, I started planning my own investment dealer or um, property. We were, what we were doing was property management, property brokerage, just like a realtor would broker downtown towers. We were brokering underground reservoirs. That's where I was with that small shop. I jumped ship joined with a great partner, a guy named Jamie Mackey, and we invented a firm called Wilson Mackey. And we spent a couple of years toiling. First year, we covered our costs, and the second year, we had a, 
uh, out of the park home run a number of times in terms of our investment, the things we were selling. So we were, again, working as a broker, uh, got paid on, uh, on transaction, not for our time, but for results. So we were pretty focused on that. Coming out of that, Wilson Mackey experience, I started a friendship partnership with uh, three other guys, Murray Edwards, who's uh, one of the iconic global investors, truly iconic. And then Jimmy Davidson and uh, Rick Grafton, two of the best salesmen, the uh, energy industry, the sales industry, the uh, investment industry has ever seen two of the best. And so we got together and we spent time Every It was started out once a month, and then it went to every second week. But we would meet downtown at the Petroleum Club in Calgary. But we agreed to come in at different times so nobody saw us together. And uh, we would spend 7, 6 p.m. Till, till midnight in the planning phase, just setting up. What does the firm look like? How many employees? Where are we going to office? What's our business model going to be? Are we going to focus on just energy? And, you know, a lot of conversation. We stuck it out. And we stuck it out. It took us almost about eight or nine months to get to the point where we could apply to start a new firm because there was regulatory requirements in the investment industry and they were complicated. They were confusing. Toronto felt like it controlled Canada, whereas the Alberta Stock Exchange was a standalone independent saying, no, no, we can do it. So we went with them. Toronto didn't like that, blah, 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 kept working away and solving problems as we went. But we ended up I go back on any question you have, but we peaked at about 125 employees, Calgary and London, England was where we were operating. And then I retired at uh, 13, 14 years. And uh, it was a great run. Absolutely delighted to, uh, in fact, my, <laughs> I still use First Energy for all my energy work. I read your book, as we discussed, and in it, I read the story of the early 90s when you were unhappy at your first job and yeah. contemplating starting your own company. But coincidentally, on a flight, you met a guy named John Hallowell, who gave you the confidence to leave, saying that he would <laughs> hire you. Yeah. How important do you think that moment was in your career trajectory? You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurship is tied to risk. There's a lot of, a lot of people who uh, are afraid of risk others that celebrate it. And in my case, I had to manage the risk. And the idea of leaving to start my own firm was a bit daunting. And again, I'm chatting with this guy, John Halliwell, who on an airplane and uh, somewhat flippantly, I said, well, yeah, someday I might go out on my own. And he said, well, if you do, I would hire you. And that, that was confidence building because, uh, yeah, I didn't have a chance to, I was working for a firm and I didn't have a chance to go asking people, Hey, if I start my own firm, are you willing to work with me? So I had to use internal judgment and that very soft comment by John, which was, if you went on your own, I would hire you. He didn't say I should, didn't, there was no, no advice, just a, a willingness to support me. And I ended up doing some work for him, but you know what? It was almost two years before his firm had business for me, two years from when we started. And that's fine. It all worked out very well. But it was, there was no question that his comment was pivotal and call it risk reduction. Now, some cynics would say, all he said was he would hire you. And no guarantees, no assurances, no budget, no plan, no an outcome, just a willingness to hire me. And, but for me, that was all I needed. That was what I was, I guess, short of at the moment where I was trying to figure out what do I do next with my business life? Because I could go back to a big investment bank or start my own. And the idea of starting my own, even the investment services of brokering properties, the idea of doing that on my own, it was daunting. Mm -hmm. And John was very helpful. Yeah, uh, I guess a young family and a mortgage at the time. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, to add to that, yes, I had, uh, it was a second Stress. mortgage that funded the uh, the office uh, renovations <laughs> when we started our own firm and uh, call it Wilson Mackey. If you were to think back on the opportunity at the time, did you guys all kind of spot it or was it somebody's idea or did you all come to the same conclusion that First Energy was a big opportunity? So I approached Murray Edwards, 
and we'd been university friends, partners, done all sorts of stuff, overlapped, we'd done events. No, we didn't have it. Neither of us had any money, so there was no investments, but we talked business all the time. And that continued when I worked as an engineer and he was continuing as a, uh, a young uh, law student at, in Toronto after finishing his business degree. So we kept conversations going. When I started Wilson Mackey, it was a step out and I needed capital. And Mackey had some capital. I had some capital. And we were struggling to figure out just how much do we need? Again, how many months overhead? How much renovation? You know, what are we doing? There's costs of marketing. What are we doing? So I juggled and struggled a little bit. But at one point, I approached Murray and said, Murray, any interest in being a partner and getting this firm up and running? And again, great friend. But his pitch to me was expensive. And I looked at it and said, mm, no, not going to do that. Appreciate the offer, which was all the money needed, but a pretty healthy coupon and equity and upside and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, mm, no. So we kept bumping along. And again, a second mortgage covered my costs and we kept going. But that kept the dialogue going. So Murray and I talked from time to time. Again, talked as friends, talked as business, but we also talked as what is Wilson Mackey doing and where is it going? And he was certainly encouraging, saying, what about what about making it a full service investment bank? And that was what led into the conversations about taking Wilson Mackey, which was effectively the operating um the corporate finance group of an investment bank and growing it with the right people. And Murray and I got talking. Again, we weren't planning a new firm until all of a sudden the conversation evolved to, well, what if Wilson and Edwards and then these two salesmen, Grafton and Davidson, came together and that changed everything. And so once we brought those guys in, that was the uh, the starting point. Now, they were both working full time. So they couldn't disclose that they were actively engaged with starting a new firm. So when we went in for regulatory approvals, it was Brett and Murray starting a new firm. The reality was once we had regulatory approvals, we'd be able to fully disclose you know, all our partners. So, And we did that. When we opened the firm, we actually had an advertisement that ran in the Calgary Herald, and we went to the trouble of listing all the employees and we were, uh, the list was short. So we even added a couple of uh, nannies who'd come in to help do data entry. So we we just, we bumped the, we built the firm, we bumped the firm. But we got off to a start, a great, a great start in um, September of 1993. By October, the energy market was collapsing. So we started with what looked like a pretty robust run, but it was a year before we really got engaged with doing financings. But we made money doing financings, trading stock, and doing corporate finance advisory work. So there was a, trying to get everyone together on the same page, not easy. But it's never easy. That's the essence of bringing together people who are highly, uh, highly motivated, highly incented. They've all got a view. Mm -hmm. And then trying to get that view aligned. That was a ton of fun. It was a ton of work, but it was a ton of fun doing it. Do you remember the day you met Murray Edwards? And did you realize the business acumen that lay within your friend at the time? Well, we, we met when I became a student representative for the College of Engineering. They were called Members at Large at the University of Saskatchewan. So M-A-L. And it turned out my first night in the... Uh, Central Students Body meeting, uh, it was a horseshoe, and I was sitting on one side. Murray Edwards was sitting on the other side, representing as an MAL the uh, College of Commerce. That was the first night. The second night we met a week later, Murray and I sat side by side because the banter in the first night created enough conversation that we got to know each other, shook hands afterwards, said hello, and we got to the event. And uh, quite frankly, we sat side by side for an entire year and made fun of the fact that we had two, the engineers and the commerce students had aligned uh, to fight communism in Saskatchewan on campus. And candidly, there was a lot of extreme socialism, communism on campus. And we took a view that, no, we want to run this as a business, not a charity. And, uh, 
and we did well. So again, that's where Murray and I started was playing politics. And uh, the next year I became president of the Engineering Student Society and he went on to become vice president of finance for the central students body. So we kept our connection at a, at a political level very high, at a friendship level also very high. So by the time we graduated, uh, we spoke regularly. That's probably the best way of putting it. To be blunt, Murray and I just got along great. And he had a, we didn't have a plan to start a business. When he came, when he became a lawyer in Calgary, I had him incorporate a couple of uh, partnerships that I needed. So we worked just, you know, it was, it was mutual trust is probably the best way of describing it. Cause you know, when you're working with a young partner at a law firm planning the future, it's pretty hard to say that that young partner or any of us were going to go on to bigger and better things. So it's pretty fair to say that he was an important part of First Energy. But remember, he was the only guy that wasn't there. He showed up. We only saw him on Tuesday or Wednesdays for the partners meeting. So that was his an all-in engagement. But one of the great things that happened because of Murray not being in the firm, not getting paid a salary, not not getting anything other than sharing in the dividends whenever, and we weren't sure when we would have dividends. Now we did, but we weren't sure when we started the firm. So when Murray coming to the partners meeting, partners meeting had a higher degree of focus than probably most people's partners meetings because generally you'd come into a group or a team meeting for a firm and everybody works together so they know everything. And so it's a matter of trying to bring together what information's missing, whatever. But when Murray showed up, the best part of that was that he had no background in terms of what had happened on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday included, Monday, Tuesday. So Wednesday became a, what have we done? Where are we at? Where are we going? And those conversations were every week and it was powerful. Murray was also a potential client of the firm with doing business. So we had to be very careful in terms of managing, you know, what we did with Murray's relationships, Murray's investments. But he ended up, he stayed invested for, I was invested for 13 years. I think he was invested for 15 or 16 before he sold out. So again, over time we disappeared, but it was a, you know, what really happened is that the uh, investment process brought together the partnership as friends. We also had a process where we believed in uh, consensus. I don't think we ever voted. It was a matter of, are we good? And you'd look around and if there was any objection, speak up. But again, we weren't voting. It wasn't seven to six in terms of doing stuff. It was chasing consensus. And that's probably one of the the best things we did because it wasn't a matter of having three people whose views outweighed the others. It was a matter of consensus. Sort of a handshake deal, cowboy ethics strategy. <laughs> no, very much so. I mean, I love the when you make reference to the book or the the entirety of cowboy ethics. That's really Without knowing it, that's really the way we worked, really the way we lived. We had partners who were relatively quiet, didn't say much. They came, they went, did their job. We had other partners, myself included, who were pretty aggressive and active in terms of, uh, you know, being boisterous when we needed to be boisterous. I mean, we, as a, as I shared with you, we started the firm with a handful of employees. But, you know, within, within a year, pardon me, within a few months of starting the firm in its first year, we had a, a phenomenal conversation about the use of charity as our marketing budget. And, you know, many firms, big investment banks, whatever, would run tombstone ads, they're called, which would say, here's the, here's what we did. And it's a picture in a, you know, a five by seven, eight by 10 that they ran in the national papers explaining or expressing their celebration of doing their own financings. We decided to take the money that would go into advertising in that model and to turn it into charity. And we were creative. We were innovative. We had people dedicated to this. And, the, you know, I was, I led the charge, but I certainly had support and, and partnership in terms of what we were doing. And we made the decision to get our name out. We supported over 200 charities in our first year in business, but we were also very conscious of making sure that every charity we supported was either tied to or um, in some way connected to a potential client. And we were shameless about it. Yes, we want to support our clients. Now, did we do some other work? You know, uh, there was a... Um, 
a small charity that focused on uh, funding high school girls who had gotten uh, pregnant and had a child. And so they were single with a child, not finished high school. So that charity, one of our staff brought it to us and we went, yeah, this makes sense. So we're going to support that in a meaningful way. And often some of the more interesting charities, some of the partners, I would explain to them what we were doing on a monthly basis. And some of the partners would say, I'll give more. I love that conversation. I will give more. And so they wanted to know who to talk to, who to, what to give to. But in the case of this charity, I still remember, and I get emotional about this. Uh, we got a letter from the charity after the support we'd given them because we were the only people of size helping out. And we were unknown. Who the heck, who the heck is First Energy? Nobody knew the name. Nobody knew the brand. But the letter I got from the woman who ran it, and then she wrote out a few examples of we helped, you know, Darcia with blah, and we helped Emily with blah. And she was explaining that. And it was because of our support. I read that letter to our staff Christmas party. Probably one of the more valuable experiences I've ever had is, you know, sharing with our people, the team, what we were doing in terms of community. It's one thing to say, yeah, we financed 42 companies and we raised $6 billion and all that stuff. That's fun. That's exciting. But it was, what did we do for the community? And again, um, hundreds. And by the, again, first year was 200. Uh, at the peak, I had over 500 charities in our database, actively supporting about 300 of them. And that meant that there was, you know, 300 checks a year. Now, the other thing we did with charities, we were pretty aggressive at sending a check to the charity with a cover letter. Cover letter said, we're first energy. We're here to help. And here's the money, blah, blah, blah. But I made sure that two partners signed every check letter. So we got our name out because I wanted not just my name, but I wanted the name of all the partners. So every letter that went out, two partners signed. And if they asked us to send it to their bookkeeper, we went, mm, no, we're going to send it to the chairman and make him carry the check down to the bookkeeper. But if he carries the check, he's carrying a first energy check, a first energy letter. He can't forget who we are. And it's hard to offend someone sending them a check. So we, again, politely ignored the, just send it to the bookkeeper and we'll take care of it. But we made sure it went in. The other thing is we made sure that we looked at who was on the board of every charity we supported so that when the charity letter went out, it was copied, CC'd to every single person on the board that we had an interest in. And again, I'm being a little flippant about that. Who did we have an interest in? Well, there was potential clients. There was existing clients. There was spouses of existing clients and potential clients. And you know what? There was also community leaders, people we just wanted to stay in touch with, whether it was Nan McCaig or, uh, or Mark Southern. I mean, I stayed in touch and they came to our events and people went, how the hell did you get those guys out? Well, I copied them on our charity checks. They knew who we were. They knew we cared. So I think we became, and I quite proudly share this, the first investment bank with a very public charitable component, charitable angle. We were really, truly dedicated to the charity, charitable community. A couple of partners didn't care. I mean, it wasn't their thing, but candidly, most of the partners and most of the staff were just enamored with the difference we were making in terms of Calgary and Southern Alberta. And we did some stuff nationally, but our focus was truly on Alberta. Just a quick thank you to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. Did you consider yourselves investment bankers or more along the lines of entrepreneurs? Hmm. You know, people, I'm going to deflect on that one. I'll come back to the answer. Across Canada, and I've been on many stages, if I'm at a university, there's often people talking about their small business and entrepreneurship classes. And I started to get very vocal on stage saying, let's separate the two. 
Small business is small business. Entrepreneurship is a way of thinking. So drop the word small business and just call it entrepreneurship. And I would tell you that because Murray Edwards, who's running a 50 or a hundred billion dollar enterprise is the ultimate entrepreneur. And so again, I take the word entrepreneurship and I take that into a, a way of thinking of a very, you know, looking at how can we do something different? How can we start from scratch? Well, people would say, well, for Canadian natural hundred billion dollars. Yeah, but they're going to see a country and that's going to be starting from scratch. And again, it doesn't matter if it's from scratch or a running start or advanced. It's the way of thinking. And so I, I strongly emphasize that entrepreneurship is a, a lifelong experience. I mean, people at one point, when they say small business and entrepreneurship, well, once you grow your business, you're no longer an entrepreneur. Bullshit. It's a non, like a non event. We are entrepreneurs based on the way we think and approach. Some people get very, you know, some people, but some people struggle. Some entrepreneurs struggle as the business grows because they're not comfortable with the size of the number of employees, the bigger the office, they're not comfortable. So they end up selling the business. Well, they're still an entrepreneur. I mean, it's just a way of thinking. And I celebrate that. I mean, I, I think entrepreneurship, uh, candidly, I didn't know I had an entrepreneurial spirit until it started to, and a little bit of looking back, I was on, on the executive of the, uh, student societies. And in one case, it was our residents. And, uh, just to tell a story out of school, it was a business called B and D enterprises, Brett and Daryl. And the folks in the residence refused to book a bus or two to take us from the residence to downtown to the Centennial auditorium and back. They're going, why bother? And I'm going, I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, the group said no. The entrepreneur in Brett, the entrepreneur in Daryl said, let's book, now by the way, minimum wage two and a quarter an hour, two and a quarter. To book a bus was 40 bucks. We booked two buses, 80 bucks we had to pay. And that was pre-pay. And of course, we're on campus, things are tight, it's, it's tough, but we paid 80 bucks for the bus two down. And then the city ended up saying, well, we'll give you one bus back for free later. So 80 bucks was our cost. We charged everyone who got on the bus a dollar. $225 came in. So 225 over 80, large, that's a large spread again at two and a quarter an hour for minimum wage. So it was kind of fun to make these buses turn into something more than, more than you would have thought possible. And we ended up doing that two or three times. But again, it was only because we were rejected by our student society that we then became. And that goes back to the way and why of how people become entrepreneurs. There's a lot of stories. Again, I'm deflecting on the, on the first energy conversation. I mean, in every single person, there was an entrepreneur right through the heart. I mean, again, it depended a bit on, you know, what they wanted. Martin Molyneux was pretty focused. Scott Ingalls loved me getting on the phone. I mean, these guys all had different approaches, but the beauty was that collaboratively, we worked as a team. Very individual in our approaches, but collaboratively as a team. But going back, so. The world of entrepreneurship is defined in many different ways and the, the experience of entrepreneurship. And I use the example of people, for example, retiring from a career and having nothing to do. They retire early or someone, especially coming out of the military, they serve, they spend 10 years, 15 years, they come out, they're 40 years old going, well, what do I do now? Well, the world of entrepreneurship gives them options. Um, in my case, I had uh, effectively had a falling out with my partner when I, I jumped to the small shop. I wasn't happy there, had a falling out left. And I had, I mean, I had a choice of either start a business or beg for a job. And I would exaggerate and beg for a job because I, I suspect I could have got back in with one of the big investment banks, but that wasn't where my headset was. I wasn't keen on, again, the spirit of entrepreneurship was starting to, to bubble and the idea of being on my own. Um, I had, once we started Wilson Mackey and First Energy, over the years, we probably had, in the time I was there, four or five approaches to buy the firm. And there was just, no, we're happy. We own it. We know what we're doing. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we go home at night. Whatever your hours are, it varies by job, varies by person, but we all know what we're doing. And who are we accountable to? Ourselves. And the idea of having an outside investor, I mean, Murray was effectively an outside investor, 
but no, he was an inside investor because he was, again, partners meetings and, and the phone would ring. If Murray had a view on something, uh, the phone would ring and a great partner. And again, I go back, Rick Grafton left after uh, six, seven years because he got more interested in the tech sector and doing, he wanted to raise money and do his own thing. And that was just how he felt comfortable. And let me be crystal clear. He left on the best of terms. You know, we're still great friends. I still see him regularly. Jimmy Davidson, I still describe him as the best salesperson the world has ever seen. What he could accomplish, we'd be stuck on a deal and he'd get on the phone and talk to a client of one of the other salesmen and they'd convert from thinking about it to all in. And Mur Jimmy was just outstanding. And they, he'd get off the phone and the whole room would erupt. And, <laughs> you know, of course the person on the other end of the phone wouldn't know how important that call was, but you know, a $3 million order on a $30 million financing when we're stuck at, you know, we've only got 12 million sold <laughs> all of a sudden 15, boom, the rest starts to fall in place. It was pretty exciting, pretty cool to be part of, for example, the cleanup of the Canadian oil and gas industry occurred in the 1990s. When I say the cleanup, it used to be that you'd divide a property by uh, two, three, five, ten, twenty, so they'd have as many investors as possible to manage the risk. And then all of a sudden, a couple of entrepreneurs stepped up, and one was Guy Turcotte, another was Murray Edwards, and they said, you know what? If we're going to manage the risk, why don't we do multiple wells instead of distributing the risk on one well? Why don't we own the risk and do it over 20 wells? And we'll get the ultimate reward without the overhead and the challenges of dealing with partners. And so you'll find in uh, the, the oil and gas industry by the end of, by the 2000 to 2010 was sort of the, uh, the final cleanup. But for the most part, when you see a company drilling, they're with one partner, two partners and themselves. It used to be 20, 30, 40. And again, that was 50 years ago. But I, and that was why I started doing property brokerage was because that was a great part of the cleanup of the, all the pieces. And again, it, uh, it caused a stir when, again, Guy Turcotte was one of the best examples, Shavko Resources. When he decided to develop a property all by himself, and I mean Shavko, people were going, can't believe, you know, there's a lot of risk and, you know, Anyway, it was the start of something great and it was good for Canada because, and there was some concern over the cleanup because people would say, people are going to be unemployed. Well, no, they're going to be better employed. Right now, all we're doing is sharing checks. Why don't we think about how do we grow the business as opposed to share the results? And so um, I'd say every industry grew as much as the landmen thought, oh, if there's, if there are no partners, what are we going to do? Well, they're, they're full up. They're full. I was just, I was the keynote speaker for the Canadian Landman's Association last year, and I've never seen more engaged, more excited, more enthused. And so as much as what was in 1990 was dividing the properties up, now this is about getting big deals done. And that's what's happening. And I'm pretty proud to be, you know, part of the platform that built what's happening now. In order to be successful in business, you have to be different. How did you prevent yourself and First Energy from doing the backstroke in the mainstream throughout the years. How are you different? Well, a couple of, a couple of observations. One was a uh, pretty high focus on the uh, engagement with the partners. So we had partners meetings. We had partners plus active meetings, active being the people that work directly under the partners and the administrative staff, frankly, didn't care. But we also did meetings where the administrative staff were included. So we had everyone, absolutely everyone. And we were regular in that. And uh, the more often we spoke, the other thing is we were candid. Just as this conversation is going, it was, guys, you got a problem. You know, if you want to do a one-off, any partners available. But if you want to talk about it right now in terms of what the firm's doing, where it's going, what we should be celebrating, what we should be doing different, speak up. And it was actually in those meetings with the, uh, the, the bigger group that we had some of the more creative suggestions and ideas that we acted on as in terms of charity events, first rowdy, first rodeo, first easy, first, you know, blah, blah, blah. As we ran all first decade in the party that we celebrated our, our first decade of business, first boat, we did a 300 people at my cabin, blah, 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 many years ago. So we started doing things with the involvement and engagement of a larger group. So it wasn't dictated down, but it was earned up and brought 
up. So we really had, I would call, extraordinary engagement. There was certainly, we lost a few people over the years. We added a few people. We, we grew a lot of our partners. And when I say grew, they came from the inside. We didn't bring from the outside. It caused a bit of a stir the first time that it was, gosh, we'd been there 10, 12 years before we ever brought a partner into the firm. It was a, it was a long, a long shot. So we grew our own is probably the best way of describing it. What we wanted to do was build a team that was extraordinary, build a business that was competitive. We didn't want to be low cost. We didn't want to be high cost. I mean, there's people in the investment industry that charge eight and 10% for equity. Well, that's the highest risk, the most charismatically sold stories. And then there's the, the 2%, 3%, whatever is being paid now by the, by the big financings. We were somewhere in the middle and we wanted to stay in the middle. We wanted to be considered the best in terms of research, but we wanted to be competitive in everything we did. And the other thing was, as I shared some of this, was our charity angle caused a huge stir in the community. You know, we had competitors who would take clients cat skiing or helicopter skiing or whatever. So clients would do that. That was a direct gift to the customer, no question. But we ended up with probably longer term profile by supporting that customer's or his spouse's charity. When we did a financing, the, there was always a prize for charity. Day to day, there was always checks going to charity. And it, we, you know, internally, we referred to it as our marketing budget. It was marketing. And we were the first to actually take charity and publicly acknowledge that we were using our name, our money to build brand with that charity. It wasn't just about the cause. Don't get me wrong. The cause matters. We wouldn't fund a cause that we didn't believe had merit. I mean, just by example, you see people's names, including mine, on buildings. So there's acknowledgement, there's recognition. The higher the donor, the more the recognition is in most charities. They'll have a Christmas tree effect, a pyramid effect, where the top person is the key sponsor. Well, that's key sponsorship. They're getting their brand, but they're not doing anything with it. We chose to do something with it right from the start. I still remember the first year, we had the partners sit down and each partner was allowed to put 10 names forward for charity. Eight partners, 10 names, that should be 80 names. But it became 50. Why? Because there was overlap. There was children's charities, there was a hospital, there was breast cancer, there was all sorts of stuff. And I took that list of 80, I thought could be 80, it ended up at 50. And I sat down with one of the partners and we came up with the idea, instead of doing it so randomly, based on what we want. Why don't we do it based on what our clients want? And that was the small evolution. You know, I run into in the entrepreneurship world, people talking about my business gives dollars to the charity of my choice. Therefore you should buy what I'm selling. Well, what about if you gave to the clients, the customers, their goal? Now, if you if you're selling to a thousand people, you're not going to have a thousand charities, but there's got to be one charity that would appeal to most of them or many of them, as opposed to your charity, which could be random, could be special, could be great. But if it doesn't tweak the customers, you haven't adopted the marketing model. And we got, again, candidly, I got a little bit of criticism from people, but a whole lot of accolade as we developed our brand based on using charity. We were, we just advertised, we branded, we had our name on all sorts of things. We had and more importantly, as I shared that, those charity checks went out and all of a sudden people are like, who the hell is First Energy? And this is without having any business connection to us, but they've now heard the name. They know that we're doing something. And, you know, we had inbound, we, we'd do charity events to do some fundraising and whatnot. Like we, we invented the idea of running a party for free, but you, the client, come and give a check to the charity and then we'll have three or four charities. So you can pick one, pick all, but here are the charities we're choosing. So they're, and they're generally very broad in their approach, but it was just the idea. We'll pay for the party. You pay for the charity. Never been done. You know, a couple of times people would have a bowl at the door and you could put 20 bucks in the bowl. No, I wanted a thousand. I didn't want 20 bucks from a customer, but we were raising a quarter of a million and plus plus at parties within three or four years of getting going. Enormous feedback, great feedback outcomes. So I'm very proud of the, again, the biggest point of differentiation for First Energy beyond we were cradle to grave. And one of the things that none of our competitors were, 
was in the energy industry, they weren't cradle to grave. And by that, helping start, helping finish. You know, lots of companies started, got into the model. Uh, there used to be in the 1990s, you know, you'd own it forever. The, the idea of trading, selling, merging, new businesses, it just it was so foreign. But by the early 2000s, it was very much ordinary course. So for 15 years, starting in around 2000, it was unbelievable the amount of activity that occurred with the back and forth between um, starting new businesses, growing the businesses, and then ultimately selling the business. And we made the decision to stay connected all the way. Now, we may lose a client as, a, as we're a focused, specialized firm. We may lose a client in terms of being 40% of the syndicate might go down to 5%, but that 5% in terms of our earnings might be greater than the 40 when we got started. So again, help start, help grow, and then help unwind or finish or sell. That was, that was our business model. And then we used charity as our marketing budget. Boom, there's our business. Do you remember the day maybe you woke up in the morning or we were heading home after a day of work and you realized uh, this business is actually doing really well and that I'm not worried anymore and that this is going great? I wish that had happened. And when I say that, I, I acknowledge that the uh, the first decade, call it from 1990 to 2000, and 2000 roughly, those 10 years, I was rarely home. And I can't replicate what I lost in terms of spending time with family. I just lost that. The other thing is that as we grew the business, I mean, the growth rate was expon it was almost exponential. So every year was better. So as much as we could smile and enjoy last year, this year looks like it's going to be even better. And so how do we keep going? How do we keep rolling? And that was a big part of what kept, uh, kept me going. Ultimately, a burnout occurred and I ended up in uh, what was basically an addiction treatment program called the Meadows. One of the great things that happened at the Meadows, I, I booked in for a month caused quite a stir with my partners because they were worried that at the end of the month I was going to quit. And I said, no, I just think that my life is going to be better if I continue down this path. And again, I'd become pretty absorbed in the business world because it was rewarding. Every minute I spent generated relationships or revenue. Well, why not spend another minute? Well, the cost was, and again, kids knew I loved them because I was working hard for them. Well, that got me nowhere ultimately with the, uh, when I look back. But uh, in terms of heading to the meadows, probably the most important thing I did there was reprioritize. And it was a conversation on the second or third day that led me to a rethink of what are the priorities in my life? Because, you know, the first time you sit down, you talk and I'd say, well, art's a priority and, and travel's a priority and building my business is a priority. But none of it was relevant to the reality of my life. And uh, as I came out of the, the meadows, and I ended up leaving after a week, and I left with the encouragement of my counselor. The counselor basically said, you know why you're here and you know what you got to do. So go home, you know, go do what you should be doing. So the repurposing, the rebranding, if you will, in terms of my own priorities suddenly became number one is my health. Number two is family. Number three is friends. Number four is learning. Number five is the work you actually do to pay the bills. And number six is community. That's how I ranked them all. But to spend a moment, health, Everything you do about health, physical, mental, doesn't matter. Whatever you can possibly dream of related to your health is a priority. You know, you've got to be able to deliver to your rest of your list, if you will, with a healthy, healthy mind, healthy body. And again, it's just about prioritizing. Where do you spend your time? Number two, family. I worked hard. I, you know, I've got some family that I'm not close to. Others I'm extremely close to. And uh, I have three kids. They're all married. They all have kids. There's uh, 12 of them in total when you count my kids, their husbands, and the grandkids. And they have become an incredible priority. You know, I just got back from two weeks in Australia where my son lives with his partner and their two-year-old daughter. I'm off to Belize shortly with my other daughter. I'll spend a week with her and three kids and somehow in the sand and the beach. I think we can do it. And then I've got some very close friends I'm with, kind of a guy's trip, but we're off to Tanzania in May. 
So again, I'm working with family, I'm working with friends, again, active spending time with them. I love my time alone. I'm going to be really candid about that too. I enjoy my time alone, but I'm far more engaged with family and friends than I'd ever thought I'd be in terms of where I do spend time. So both are important. I do spend time on both. And then I talk about the career and uh, or education and career. Life is a lifelong learning opportunity. And some of it's just having a conversation like we're having right now. Others are the, again, the charity work, the business stuff I do. The learning curve is steep. You know, last night I sent a very important letter to the mayor and the entire council of a city where we're doing work. And so that letter took three hours, three hours to draft a one page letter, but interrupted by phone calls, interrupted by staff, took a little longer than expected, but it was important to me because, and it was learning as I went, what, what, how much information do I give at this point in time to who and how? And it, it all comes down to effectively, uh, a restructuring, a rezoning that we're doing on a property. So here I am still learning and I love that I'm still learning. To get back to career a little bit, best deal you ever saw in the energy industry, maybe the Amber Energy deal going from 30 cents to $30, one stick out? Oh, Amber certainly worked out. One that I was far more engaged with was um, Bacalta. They were stuck. They were buying a property down in Ecuador and I had... uh, told the guy running the company that, yeah, we'd look at that. (laughs) Well, he comes in, he's got something interesting. We have to raise $5 million and we have four days to do it. It's private. It's effectively private. Nobody knows the company and they have no experience ever in Ecuador. So I now go to some high risk investors and I have to put up money in order to convince them that it's a real deal. And I, you know, drag in Murray and I drag in Jim and I drag in Rick and, and then we bring in some clients and we bring in some blah, blah, blah. And it was a tough deal to put together, but we had four days, five days, five million bucks, but we were raising money at a buck and a quarter. I was also the broker that helped sell the company three years later for, and we ended up getting $13. So a buck and a quarter to 13, pretty good run. But what was important was that we played a role in starting. In fact, I mean, Picalta had some business operations, but helping them raise 5 million, real quickly to get a deposit in, helping them raise another 50 million to fund the development of the property, helping them blah, 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 as we worked. And then all of a sudden inbound, there was interest in the company as a whole and we helped them sell the company. So almost cradle to grave in a classic fashion. Do you remember your last day at First Synergy when the train had come to the last stop, so to speak? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Was it bittersweet? It was a bit of a blend. The partners and I, several of us were working together trying to figure out who would be the next president of the firm. Cause I was trying to give up that role. I was president and CEO and I was trying to give up president and we were having debates over who should be next. Someone out of sales, someone out of research, someone out of corporate finance. I ultimately won the argument, sold, you know, the group on the, on the outcome that we agreed on. And that was very, very, very rewarding for me as an internal process goes, just figuring out who my successor could be in terms of what I was doing, but I wasn't leaving. Anyway, that was um, in May of 2007. My 50th birthday was July 1st, 2007. So two months later, and it was tied to my birthday that I made the decision. I'm turning 50. What's next? You know, I've invested in a lot of things. I enjoy some wealth outside of First Energy. I enjoy First Energy, don't get me wrong, but it's time. And so I let my successor step up in an even bigger way, and I became just chairman. And so I stayed as chairman for a couple of years, but my role as chairman was quite small. Again, partners meetings, whatnot, but I I wasn't nearly as active as I had been because I was now looking after my own stuff, my own businesses. So... Yeah, it, it, because it tied to my 50th birthday, it's memorable. It's an easy thing to, if you will, get uh, get emotional about. Because saying goodbye to, again, every day there was, I can't remember now in Calgary, 75 to 100 people. You know, she'd come in, I would always wander the floor, see who was, you know, chit-chat. So I, I regularly engaged, and all of a sudden that was over. That was probably the... The mix and mingle of downtown was what I lost. And I certainly missed it for a while, but then sort of built my own 
brand new network of activities and adventures. And we're, you know, I'm still very busy in the power industry, very busy in farmland, very busy in real estate, very busy in um, sports. There's lots going on. Where do you think you learned the most business acumen from that allowed you to make that step into a broader business interest? Did you just read about it or it's, would you, was there a mentor or is it just slowly through the years? You know what? There's an element of mentorship. Many times I've been asked if I would uh, mentor someone and I politely say, just my time's just not, I just don't have regular time. But what I did in terms of how I got mentored was I simply watched some of the most impressive entrepreneurs, whether it was Richard Branson or in Calgary, a guy named Dick Haskane, watching what they did, walking in the, in the path that they led. I didn't need advice. I just needed to watch and see what others had done. And so that's kind of my advice in the world of mentoring is, you know, look at who you admire and respect in terms of where they are now. Look at where they were and follow the path from where they were to where they are and see how that fits for you. In my case, you know, I turned 50 and all I wanted to do was my own private investments. You know, I'm now you know, 67, but the last couple of years have been really difficult health-wise. But as I clean up health, I then turn to family and friends. Not business, family and friends. They rank ahead of business. And we're selling a few things. We're still making a few things. But my desire to be actively involved with growing new businesses has gone. And again, that's my retirement moment. It's, I have that right. And cleaning up and uh, organizing the businesses I've been investing in, that's a full-time job for a few people. As we get towards the end to touch on Canadian energy, is there further consolidation in the industry ahead? If you were to look at things now? I wouldn't say so right now. I think there's a lot of public businesses. They're growing it used to be that there was sometimes it was people issues, sometimes balance sheet issues, and sometimes asset issues that triggered mergers. I'm just not seeing that kind of activity now. It's not nearly as busy as it once was. Why? Because companies, whether it's Topaz or Tourmaline or Canadian Natural or Whitecap or Vermilion or Arc Energy or blah, blah, blah. And I've got business relationships going back. Every name I just gave you, I have some connection to. So I watch them and I pay attention to them, but they're all growing without a need to be merged or sold. So that's generally the observation. And there's certainly an opportunity for new companies. I'm just not on the ground playing that game anymore. You don't need advice as much anymore, but if you were to bounce ideas off somebody or anyone in general, do you go to anyone nowadays to just talk business? Who do you look towards in the business community? So there's a guy that was put in my room, so to speak, and I was put in his room, but my random, random roommate at university when I lived in residence is also a best friend and he's also my president. And so what we do now is very much together. So I've got, that guy is just living internal to me in terms of what we do. He's all day long and we've been best friends now for 40, 45 years. And it's kind of cool when you take a friend and turn him into a key business partner. Because I won't even think so many of the investments or taxes without his his input in that. So that's important. I certainly stay connected to the business community. I'm active in terms of staying connected. When I see an event, charity or business where I have a chance to mingle, I'll go. The cause doesn't matter. The time doesn't matter. To be blunt, the cost doesn't matter. It's who's there. Is it worth my time? And if I get a chance to go mingle, and I emphasize that to everyone listening, the word mingle is one of the most important things you can learn how to do. Because mingling for me is a paraphrasing of getting to know others, spending time with others. And again, I, I don't need, I don't want to start a brand new business. I'm just not in that game. But what else am I doing? Whether it's community or discharging the businesses I do own. Well, speaking of time, uh, I know it's valuable, so we'll wrap up the formal conversation there. All good. I appreciate your your engagement and your time, and you obviously did some homework, so thank you on that. I appreciate it. We'll end it there. Hello, listeners out there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully the episode provided some insights. If you enjoyed the show, check out trose.ca where more episodes are yet to come. You can also subscribe to the podcast where your token of support is much appreciated. 
Until next time, happy coffee drinking. 